Bom. So as always, we'll give a few minutes for people to um, finish the registration, get in the rooms and, and come along and we'll, we'll probably get going uh, in a small group conversation to start with. And I know that other people will be joining us uh, as, as the afternoon progresses. So, and um, uh, Ms. Garza will join us around at around five o'clock. So we have some time to get going. So as we as we enter this afternoon, I uh, want to welcome start welcoming everybody and realize that people could be coming in. It's, it's that time of the uh, of the day where people are moving between uh, places and traffic gets in the way and between classes back and forth. So we'll be able to uh, uh, bring people in as they join us and we can start and restart. But I want to start by welcoming everyone who's here. Uh, my name is Hardin Coleman. I'm the faculty director of the uh, BU Wheelock Center for Character and Social Responsibility, which has been for 30 years, has been focused on these issues related to what is the role of, of uh, taking, of growing one's ability to take uh, strong personal stances with a real eye to how to improve the quality of their life and those of others and the relationship between who am I in my world and how do I take responsibility for the social world to improve it and create conditions in which all people and all children can flourish. And that is our, our focus. And, and, and uh, right now the center is, is uh, working on creating communities of conversations around what it means to uh, be caring, uh, have character, and uh, create community and, and, and give examples of people who are doing that work. And as those of you had the opportunity to read uh, Ms. Garza's work, this is key to the work that she does and that she really has taken a focus on how to uh, build communities, particularly communities that have historically been dis disenfranchised for opportunities to power and how they can, we, they can start working together across a wide diverse range of belief and platforms. I think one of the things that uh, we want to take away from today is the understanding that, uh, that in, in this polarized society in which we are living, that there are people who are trying to work and bring those communities together in Ms. Garza's work is a good example, a model for uh, driving that conversation, even um, as she has particular populations that she is dedicating her work to. So one of the things we want to do, so I just want to go quickly over the agendas. We're going to start with small group conversations. And as more people join uh, this group, we will do some breakout groups. But right now, we'll start with people we are with to kind of lift up the questions you have about the book. Many of you have read it or, or seen the video or read about um, some of the work that Ms. Garza is doing uh, nationally. And we want to uh, spend some time lifting up questions you may have, and particularly the idea of what questions you want to ask for her. So we are going to use each group to then come forward with the questions uh, that you want to hear her respond to. Ms. Garza will join us at five o'clock, at which point she's going to give a very brief uh, conversation and, and uh, about her work and then uh, uh, Dean Elmore has uh, volunteered and we're very thankful for that to uh, facilitate the conversation of answering the questions that we've raised up and, and then also uh, facilitate that conversation. And then when she's given her presentation, we're gonna go back into small groups and the real question there is gonna be, you know, based on what the conversation we're having today, what actions are you gonna take? And, and what do you think are, are your next steps based on what, what this learning? And then we wanna come back into the large group 
group and have people share, uh, particularly if there's some consensus in the small groups we break into, people share their perspectives. So uh, without further ado, I want to uh, say, I want to start by thanking uh, Maryam Medeo, who is so critical to uh, all our events at, at, at Wheelock in terms of coordinating and bringing this webinar together, and, and uh, Elizabeth Barquet, who is uh, uh, working in the center for us this year, who's been you know, just wonderful in the production, and of course, thanking the, uh, the uh, Dean Elmore for providing and sharing his time with us. So I'm there here. So I want us to jump right in. Those of you who know me know that uh, informality is, is, is my style. And so I really, be, I want to start hearing what questions that you have and the, your reactions to the book and how, what it meant to you. This seminar, this webinar is my reaction. You know, that my reaction to it was that this is a powerful voice about the importance that, that understanding that power exists in our world and that all of us from wherever we sit need to find that way to and in ourselves, how do we make commitments to using the power we have in community to drive change. So that, and I want to broaden that conversation uh, with other people. So I don't, I, as those of you who read the book and are thinking about the book, I just would love to have an opportunity for you, the questions that you have for uh, uh, Ms. Garza or your commentary about the book. Hey Harden, can I jump in and ask you a question? Yeah. Yes, sir. So, so how did this book get on your shelf? How did this book come to be in your hands? And I, I'm going to ask anybody that. How'd you get to this book? A great question, Kenya. And you're testing my my my, my fractured memory. Um, I was, uh, I think, I heard a brief podcast with her. And it struck me, and, and, and I'll be honest, as, as many of you know, I had the privilege of having conversations across what we would call the social political spectrum, from deep conserved thinkers uh, uh, to people who would see themselves as uh, primary progressives and, and working uh, against systemic uh, problems of capitalism. I get to be in the room with people. And so when I started her book, obviously I came in with some understanding. And so what drove me and kept me reading it was this idea that there's conversations that need to be had across our groups and how, how, how important that is to understand and work with. And I was compelled by her story and her own history about how she negotiated so many uh, different parts of our society to come to her positionality. Thank you. So I, I won't be shy, you know, that, uh, you know, I've, I've given my middle school wait time. So Mozik, uh, what, what brought you here? And uh, you want, to, and, and since I know you, if you would, so we're a small group, which is wonderful. You wanted to give a brief introduction to the work you're doing. And then what are the questions you have of, for Ms. Garza? So what brought me here was your invitation. <laughs> and um, unfortunately I can't stay for the whole thing. And I wanted to just sort of, um, join as long as I could. We have a, um, another event that I got to host at six o'clock. So I have to leave in a few minutes before six. Mm -hmm. So we are, a Higher Ground is a organization in Roxbury focused on education and early childhood development. The event we have this evening is something we sponsor every month in collaboration with NAACP Boston and the Commonwealth Seminar. It's called the Cross Community Crossover Dialogues. And it's about the um, experiences of various communities in greater Boston uh, from various backgrounds of you know, racial, ethnic uh, backgrounds. So we've had presentations uh, on the indigenous uh, experience, African-Americans, Latinos, Asians. And tonight's uh, discussion is gonna focus on the experience of the Ukrainian and Russian communities in Boston, given what's going on in their country. Um, so although our work is focused on education, underlying everything we do is equity. And we're just using equity and education as the uh, overarching met tool by bringing organizations together to uh, work together to address uh, educational equity, housing uh, instability, various things related to children and families. And we are part of something that the uh, Harden um, helped organize called the Open Opportunity Massachusetts. And um, the Higher Ground is one of two uh, community sites to demonstrate 
the Thriving Families Lifelong Learners uh, uh, Initiative of Open, Open Opportunity. So um, I have not read anything yet. Uh, mm -hmm. So I just want to confess up front, but I'm interested in uh, reading it and learning more uh, and participating as long as I can on this conversation. Okay. Thank you. So I see Roseanne Flores jumped off before I could call on her. So Eleonora, what, what brings you to the conversation? Hi, Harding. Hi. Um, very much like the speaker before, it was your email that attracted me to the conversation. But I have to say that one of the things that I have been always interested in is anything that has to do with the development of values and the importance of community for that. So coming from the background that I come from in terms of my studies of moral development and ethical development, trying to understand character development and community and the intersection of um, or, and the importance of community when we're trying to develop a caring and, and a caring society has always attracted me. So it was your email, but it was also the title of the, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Of the conversation that said, oh, this is uh, the core of what I have always been fascinated by. So um i have not had time to read the book i have read sort of pieces of it but not like the one that i want to sit down and read and study in a way and i'm really looking forward to listening to the presentation today and unfortunately i do too have to leave at 5 30 for another meeting um that that has been scheduled for a long time and i need to be present but if that ends early enough i'll come back come back in great great yep. great but thank you. Thank you for having mm -hmm. having organized these for all of us. Yeah, yeah. So I can keep calling if someone doesn't, unless someone wants to volunteer. Mm -hmm. I can volunteer next. Great. Um, great. Hi, Hardin. How's it going? Good, good. Yeah, so I'm, I'm here just because I saw that the events uh, got, got sent to me. You know, I think it gets sent out to staff. My name is Steph. I'm a operations coordinator. I work as a liaison uh, for facilities and provide administrative support to the executive director, Glenn Burgos. Um, so I'm like as far away as I could be from, <laughs> from this conversation, I think in my line of work, but I think um, in my core values as a professional, as a developing professional, I'm always looking for avenues to develop care within our community and to understand moral development. And I think, workshops like this or presentations like this are a good way to brush up on your skills um, or a good way to be with your community. It's really nice to see, you know, people who are here. Um, mm -hmm. I like getting to know my community more and more. So I'm thankful for the opportunity just to get to learn here. So thank you today. Great, great. Do you have a question for Ms. Garza that, you're, that, that you would like to hear from her, somebody that works with this nationally? Not right now, but I probably, I'm going to think about it and hopefully drop one in the chat. Great, great. Coach. I, um, thank you uh, for organizing this. And I'm, uh, you know, as, as you know, uh, one of my mentors was a guy named uh, John Yeager. And uh, he, he used to do this bit on the character and sport initiative where, where that's what kind of got me involved, deeply involved in the, the character work uh, and, and how coaching and, and sport can be a, uh, a locus for the development of, of character and but I'm also kind of really pushed recently you know in recent years uh, since I would say um, you know that hashtag take a knee <laughs> um, movements and where activism in sport are becoming uh, a very powerful change agent and uh and I'm, I'm very interested in learning more about, you know, kind of how do we think about movements? Because Ms. Garza's work is really kind of seminal in this work. And, I, and the last part is, you know, the, you know, the, the justice aspect of it, I think, mm -hmm. is really speaks to me. Uh, but I think we have, you know, the, we have a lot to bring, you know, you said the falling apart part is we have to bring a lot back together in, in our society. So I'm just so excited about this discussion. Hey, John, um, you know, one of the things that I think uh, uh, Alicia does really well is she connects 
she tells stories of the past and how those influence what she does right now. And she, she makes that really wonderful sort of connection where she's moving ahead, straight ahead to that next place, but she's also got an eye to, to the rear and to back. And I, I wonder if, you know, I knew we, we talk about taking a knee, we talk about activism, uh, but you know as well as I do that uh, uh, athletes on, on world stages have always been active and activist. And uh, I, I wonder if, if you feel like there's something that's really different right now uh, and that, that this captures the time a bit more than maybe what, I don't know, uh, a number of uh, women and men have done over time. Well, I think we're in a, you know, since, since um, Kaepernick's stance, um, there's a kind of an interesting thing and uh, because as you know, like whether it was Muhammad Ali or Tommy Smith or these kind of courageous people or Jackie Robinson, um, they, they took, you know, really courageous stances. Um, but I'm not so sure that like, like, like that, that we're the, with the capitalism and these kind of like other forces that say that that you know it's really interesting to look at how these le the leagues have taken on um, you know Black Lives Matter and uh, a lot of kind of what I call surface uh, you know surface efforts to do it, but not not deep equity efforts. You know, so I I don't know if I'm answering your question, but I, uh -huh. I think. I think that like we're all at this kind of surface level and I don't know if we're really ready to go for those deeper equity. What that means is like how we, how we spend our dollars or how we, you know, who we, what, what corporations do we, you know, support or not. And, um, and, and as you know, big time sport is, is, is wrapped up in that. What, um, so I don't know if I rambled. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, and I, I would only add that we give the shout out to people like Althea Smith and Billie Jean King and the WNBA because they have been really at some incredible forefronts that we often don't recognize as a part of these things. Uh, you know, Billie Jean King was about a movement just as much as she was about uh, anything else as, as well uh, as, as, as about being a, the, a great tennis player. And of course, Althea Smith and folks like that. And the NBA is, the WNBA is really showing some, some prowess right now. Yeah. Sorry, Harden. I'm sorry to jump in. No, there. no, no. The, the, as I'm you know, this is to, I'm just trying to warm up for later. That's right. This is a conversation. Not, not. So John, do you have a question for Ms. Garza that you would like us to kind of lift up at the end? I, the, the, I guess the, the struggle that I have is when, when I, I'm teaching classes that have to do with sport and or students that are involved in sport. And, um, you know, it has to do with like how athletes can use their voices uh, and learn from what, you know, her work in creating a movement. Because I think there's a lot of forces working against that. Mm -hmm. you know, even, even coaches or administrators are really kind of like, well, that's nice, but I don't want, you know, you saw how with the national anthem stuff, how complicated and divisive it got. Um, and so I, I think sometimes it has to get, comp, you know, it ha people have to take a stand, but also how do we, kind of move together uh i think that's i'm trying to bring it to the domain of sport as, as a because i think it also is a place where it can bring people together so um i think how do we how do we help young people raise their voices get in good trouble <laughs> if if we use that firm term but, but I heard you say two things, John. I just want to be clear. This is how do we raise up voices? How do we give people the efficacy to take powerful personal decisions yeah. in a way that builds community, doesn't fracture it? Yeah. 
So, I mean, the, the, um, I, I don't want to put words in your mouth because you know that's where I, my head is. So, is that am I hearing both of those from you? Yeah, because I think it, it's a it's a very it's a razor's edge. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, I want to thank the other people who who are, who are joining, and we we understand that this is a busy time of the day and busy time of the year. And so, what we're doing now is uh, Miss Garza is going to join us at, at around five o'clock. And right now we're having a conversation about what lifting up from the book or from your experience of her, 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 her writings or her speaking or, or what you've heard about her, what questions people have uh, for her so that we can, and that Ken, when she joins us, Ken will be, Ken Elmore, Dean Elmore will be facilitating those, those questions so that we're going around and I'm, I'm being a little more directive than I normally am. I'm calling people out. So Aaron, you've been here from the beginning and I'm wondering if you want to share with us uh, your questions for uh, Ms. Garza. Sure, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Apologies, I can't have my camera on either. So I'm a graduate student there at Wheelock and I don't have a lot of knowledge of Ms. Garza other than her name and her role in co-founding Black Lives Matter. Um, I have some experience with activism, mostly through voter registration and voter outreach efforts, but kind of beyond that, I'm curious about other opportunities for activism and really even at a more simple level, just how to be better at have or having conversations with people who are either ignorant on issues or just disagree with you completely. And just, I'm here to learn as much as I possibly can, how to navigate those situations and have a productive conversation. So I think tying back into that idea of building community, you know, I just really want to make sure that I am not only being active, but in a really productive way that's mm -hmm. adding value and creating good change. Great, great. thank you. A Allison. Hi, I'll put my camera on. Um, like Erin, I'm also a grad student here at Wheelock. Um, I didn't have a chance to read the book just because I kind of heard this through the Wheelock email chain and in class. Um, but I did know that like this is a talk that I was really interested in. And as you said, it's like Erin um, was saying that it's from like a really inspirational and influential person of our time right now, especially for like my generation coming up with like the Black Lives Matter movement. So I did know like, as far as becoming a better community member for like the greater Boston area, I did want to be included. Um, even though I haven't read the book, I it's on the list now, but mm -hmm. um, I feel like this is a really good start to that and like having those conversations and thinking of these kinds of questions. Um, so yeah, I'm excited for the rest of the evening, but I don't have any questions yet, unfortunately. Great, great. So. Well, well, John Zaff in the, in the chat wrote, writes, uh, afternoon, um, looking forward to hearing her, uh, wants to know how she developed her active identity from her many identities, and what role does she see higher education play in the world of activism? That, that, that's great. So uh, uh, I'm going to call in. I'm, I'm very happy to say that one of my high school classmates has joined us. So Jim, uh, I'm very excited to have you be here. And I'm wondering whether, what are the questions you have for either for this conversation or uh, Ms. Uh, Garza? That's Jim Wallerstein. I just unmuted. Can you hear me? Yep, yep. Yeah, so I really, um, I'm not familiar with the work. I'm familiar with her name. Um, I like, you know, um, the, the word caring um, really uh, struck me. Um, to me, I think, um, you know, how do you create environments of caring based upon heartfelt dialogue? That seems to me, um, uh, something that's that's really important in this era across uh communities whether they're communities of education or work um or religion or whatever so um you know that's you know mostly it's curiosity mm -hmm. thank you thank you very much tina I, I know you're 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 in in motion but can you talk on your phone Yes, thank you, Hart. Um, I hope everyone can hear me. It's so good to be here. And thank you for doing this, Hart. Um, and again, I'm, I apologize, my camera's off because I'm uh, unexpectedly in traffic. But um, so I haven't read um, Ms. Garza's book yet either and, and um, look forward to that. I'm the um, department chair of counseling and applied human development here um, 
at BU Wheelock and have been interested in some time um, in social justice based teaching and equity based teaching. Um, and my question, I think, for for Alicia, and I say this as a person with a white woman with racial privileges, how do you um, maintain hope, you know, as we as we engage in activism in different ways in the face of continued um, trauma, you know, for among marginalized folk and communities. Um, and again, I say that as a, as a white woman with, with racial privilege, but how do we do that? How do we continue to engage in activism and have hope and engage mm -hmm. in self-care? It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's complicated. So that's what mm -hmm. I'm wondering. Great, thank you, thank you. And, and, and Beth, I know that you're not gonna join us by video, but what, what are the kind of questions you have for Ms. Garza? Um, you know what, Harden, I'm just really here to listen and learn. I think it's a complex time in American history. We have someone who has brought great leadership to uh, and voice to the equity movement. And as someone in my late 50s, I really think it's important to sit back and listen and learn mm -hmm. from the folks on the front lines. Um, and as someone said earlier, as a white woman who has grown up with much privilege, I think it's time for folks like myself to sit back and listen. Great, thank you, thank you. So I, I know people have a chance to look in the chats, but uh, Eve Mance, who's a, a professor here in the, uh, at Wheelock, asked, how do we raise up young people's efficacy to engage in these conversations of, uh, of, uh, of change that's productive and not divisive? And I've heard that theme, Ken, I hope you can track that because I've heard that theme across several, you know, how do you, how do you push for something and ask for something and, 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 and request change and advocate a position in a way that's about cooperation as well. And that, that's a, uh, that, that balance is incredibly challenging and, and um, um, difficult to, to achieve. So Harden, I'm not sure this is what I what you want to hear, but sometimes when something is wrong, you just have to confront it. I mean, mm -hmm. I keep saying slavery used to be legal, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. injustice right now is legal. Yeah, and uh, it doesn't. It's it, you just can't cooperate sometimes without calling a problem out and holding people accountable for dealing with it. Yeah. So uh, I have a struggle with achieving a balance between provocation and. Uh, uh, cooperation. I mean, we, we work, you know, most of what we do at Higher Ground is to collaborate and put uh, collective effort together. But uh, part of the part of the driving force is the injustices that we face and we accept every day. Mm -hmm, I mean, there's mm -hmm. 4,000, as you know, there's 4,000 homeless kids attending Boston schools and we expect uh, improvement in educational outcomes. You know, in one of the richest uh, cities in one of the richest countries in the world. We can't figure out how to make sure everybody's housed. And we consider that legal. We consider that okay. Mm -hmm. Well, sometimes you just have to confront it. Um, so I'm happy to collaborate and cooperate as much as possible. But I also think that sometimes we have to make trouble. That's right. Dean Chard is agreeing with you. He asked the question, is divisiveness a necessary stage in the process? I mean, they're very much agree with you. And, and um, you know, as, as we're looking forward to the, I'm gonna call that out for this is a good follow-up conversation because one could argue, so the psychologists who believe in group formation, conflict is an, is an important and critical part of human development. Without conflict and struggle, groups don't evolve. But does that conflict have to be divisive? And that's the, so I'm, I'm hearing that, that's one of the questions we wanna ask. Mm -hmm. of, of, of Ms. Garza's perspective is it is the conflict which everyone's going to agree calling out uh, uh, evils calling out problems in the world is, is central to what we do does it have is it, is it device that as Dean Chart has is, is divisiveness necessary mm -hmm. and might divisiveness be in the eye of the beholder <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, Ken, I'm gonna push the facilitation to you because I'm gonna check my email to make sure I don't have a last minute can't make it or something else. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna let you facilitate while I uh, try to negotiate more than one screen at a time, which my age makes a uh, challenge. Oh, fantastic. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, the floor is open. We're just trying to get a bit of a conversation here about uh, things that we might want to talk with uh, Alicia Garza about. Uh, this is, I had a set of questions just in case uh, people didn't have them, but I'm throwing my questions aside uh, overall. But uh, there are a few folks who've just joined us. Uh, are, does anyone want to hop in and maybe uh, give us a sense of a question or two you might have? Feel free to hop right in here. I, I, I don't want to do what uh, Dean Coleman was doing and <laughs> call on people, uh, but uh, feel free. Or if those of you who've already uh, thrown something in, this conversation may have sparked a little bit more, go ahead and hop into that conversation. You know, I, I had this funny thing too, where I was thinking as well, whether or not the common ground is even worth it anymore. Hey y'all. Hi Alicia, how are you? I'm okay. I wanted to jump on and do this tech check, but I do need to like wash my face and put on some clothes before we start. <laughs> oh, okay. okay. <laughs> you gotta go do a costume change. I do. Not All for right. us. All Not right. for us. You know, well, you... for your team, I do. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Are we all set in terms of, I sound okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So I'm going to turn off my camera, but I'll be back in 10 minutes. 10? Okay, great. Great. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Fantastic. Harden, you back to your facilitation? Uh, you're, doing, you're doing a good job. So Mary, you've just come out of a significant political campaign, uh, being in the heart of all the issues that Boston is struggling with, and I think they represent huge national issues. So as you think about conversations with a community activist and organizer, what are some of the things that you would love to hear from her? Oh, thank you, Hardin. Um, so I, I will confess that I have read the book. It was my favorite book of last year. So um, in January of 20. Uh, 21, Ibram Kendi had a piece in the Atlantic, the 10 best political books of 2020 by black women. And that became um, my reading part of my reading list for uh, 2021. And um, Alicia Garza's book was on that. And it was amazing and powerful. And so when I assembled my team um, in City Hall, which included a couple of um, BU alum and BU interns, um, I had them all uh, read the book. So we had a kind of book club with it. And um, I felt like it was the fastest way for them to understand why and how Mayor Janey was uh, centering racial equity in all of her decision-making. And it was incredibly powerful for them to read, for all of us to read it together. And um, I think that one thing I would love for Alicia to then talk about, I think was so powerful in her book was how she was able to work across seemingly uh, disparate um, agendas to come together for collective action. And I just had a conversation with the head of one of the local, um, Darlene Lombos is a uh, Secretary for a Greater Boston Labor Council, and, and she's a Filipino woman, a woman of color. And she was saying that she st really struggles to get people to kind of come together around things like fair wages and living wages. And um, we are kind of fractionalized in our different kind of areas of activism. And I think Alicia's book had some great lessons for how to move beyond those um, issues that seem very hyper-local to us to, to work together. So I, I would love for her to kind of, how do we break that down for our students? Those are amazing lessons and mm -hmm. how do we pass those on to our students? Great, thank you. Dean, Dean Chard, I have, I have a question for you that um, is uh, uh, a part of uh, these great struggles. So, as I said earlier in the group, I, I had the privilege of being in communities across the political, economic, 
racial spectrum and I spend time in different where I hear things in one group that the other group drives the other group crazy and and it's a privilege to be in those conversations listen to them and right now I have one of my groups that is really trashing higher ed and saying how useless it is and really r1 what's their value we should be we should be disrupted in changes and you've come into this uh, college of education a university that is very committed to becoming a prominent r1 institution and you're bringing in a focus on how do we do that and drive quality community. So as you take on that challenge, I'm wondering what thoughts or questions you have from Ms. Garza about how to be uh, making change from within what one some people would think is the belly of the beast of a traditional private institution that also is trying to have a positive impact and change the world. And how do you negotiate and think that through? Uh, that's a softball question, huh, Harden? Um, well, I think, uh, you know, the, the part of the R1 piece that is so meaningful to me is that we ask the right questions. And so if you keep asking the wrong questions or study the wrong participants or focus in the wrong places, you could certainly continue the ivy, ivory tower uh, sort of um, mantle that we've been accused of. And, um, but if you go at it differently and you hire people who are asking harder questions, tougher questions, um, exploring different kinds of methodologies that can get at um, the kinds of questions that really could change the world for us around everything from public health to, um, you know, sociological changes that we know are essential to long-term thriving of a society, then I think our ones become really important um, mm -hmm. in that place. Mm -hmm. So I, I, that's the way I think about it. Are we hiring the right people, bringing people in who are asking those tough questions and, and preparing our students to ask the tough questions, which is why I think my question uh, from Ms. Garza is, is a really around how do you prepare professionals to be professionals, because we all have professional standards and at the same time be fighters, right? Activists and advocates for powerful change, which um, just seems essential to me for, to justify higher ed these days, frankly. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. So I'm not sure. So uh, so for those who are joining, what we're doing is uh, Ms. Garza is going to be on in about uh, five more minutes. And so we're this opportunity. What are the questions that you have for her that, that uh, Dean Elmo will be able to facilitate? So Carolyn, um, I'm, I'm uh, uh, wondering whether you, this is, I'm acting out my theory that my father always thought I should be a lawyer and be a law professor. So I'm, I'm working on, my, on that piece of my family history. So Caroline, what, what, what are your questions for Ms. Garza? Um, okay. Darian Letta, would you care to share some of the questions that you have for Ms. Garza? Hi, everyone. Good evening. Um, my name is Darian Letta. I use she, her, a uh, pronouns. I am an alum from BU School of Public Health, um, focusing on community health sciences. I'm a community health worker by practice, currently work for the State Department of Health. And, but also transitioning to work in a, another well-known public health a, um, company here in Boston, in which I will be um, managing a program specifically targeting Black and Latinx folks that um, use substances. And as I obviously started my work, um, it was very, very challenging to find people that actually connected medicine and public health. Now it's the new thing. Um, I don't. I don't know how many times I screamed at folks. Social determinants. Social determinants of health and health equity, a few years ago. But now it's in uh, everybody's vernacular um, because of COVID. Um, 
so I guess my question, or I guess I have a lot, so many questions, Mm -hmm. (laughs) but I think uh, one of my questions is how do we do that in a more productive way? How do we, um, or not more productive way, but that it reaches um, uh, people that look like me, the more vulnerable population that that haven't had access to um, the services, the opportunities, the, I guess, um, just more, right? More resources in order for them um, to understand that where you're at now, it it was purposefully created this way. (laughs) And um, how do we create um, these systems that, um, what with, prioritizing our safety and our um, comfortability and ourselves um, instead of having to be um, put in rooms with folks that don't necessarily believe us or think that um, we should be in those rooms. How do we give ourselves safe spaces so that we can talk amongst each other um, to create change that we want to see? I mean, there's like five questions there. (laughs) (laughs) but um connecting community health public health and well-being all together um to hopefully um have a a brighter future for black and brown communities Mm So as, as Ken asked earlier, are there um, people who've had chance to talk earlier who want to kind of follow up, uh, have a follow-up question? Or, or Professor, Professor Castro, could I turn to you and ask what, are the, what drew you here and what are the questions that you may have for Ms. Garza? Hello, hello, everyone. Yeah, well, um, I don't, uh, well, uh, really what I, uh, I'm here to learn um, from Ms. Garza and uh, insights I have not had the chance to read her book. However, I'm very interested in this topic and my work, uh, well, I'm, I'm the director of the um, Willock Institute on in Early Childhood Wellbeing. And my work uh, personally focuses on the early education of bilingual children. So one of my concerns is about precisely how do we uh, create that awareness and making the professional community, the academic community, and the community at large being uh, feeling responsible and uh, being caring and feeling, you know, that responsibility and the commitment for the well-being of young children. Um, all of young children, but in particular, those who are vulnerable, those who have been minoritized and that at at an early age uh, have to learn what discrimination feels, um, how how it feels to to feel uh, discriminated or being invisible in a a classroom, being invisible in in a community. So uh, those are the kinds of concerns that I have. And um, I'm very excited to listen to this presentation and learning from from what um, Dr. Uh, uh, Garza can share with us. Oh, great. Well, thank you. So, so uh, uh, Ms. Garza, d- delight to have you here. And so for other people who are joining in, um, Ken Elmore, um, uh, Dean Elmore has agreed to facilitate this conversation. So I'm gonna turn over, Dean Elmore is our Dean of Students here at the BU Willow College of Education and has a long history of helping this uh, institution uh, move forward in a way that uh, is more inclusive of multiple identities, multiple students, and, and, and has focused on a caring. My favorite quote for Ken is when he talks to uh, new faculty and who are in their in the new introduction. And he says, he stops and says, well, there's one, the most important thing we need from you. And he pauses and you can see all these new faculty kind of lean forward is love our students. 
and that that is the key thing that Fakken needs to do. And it sets the tone for what I think this university aspires to do, which is not only to be a great place for intellectual development, but a community of learning and a safe place to be. And I say aspire because we know that we fall short in many ways. And part of uh, Dean Elmore's role is to um, facilitate both the, the aspirations and care for those who are not meeting, getting met, their needs are not fully met. So Ken, I would love if you would uh, take over and introduce and facilitate this next part of our, our, our seminar. Fantastic. Uh, Alisa, you have to uh, you have to pardon me if I start to be a little bit of a fanboy, if I start to geek out a little bit. This is like an incredible honor when uh, Harden asked me if I could do this. So um, I, I hope I can do the honors and do everyone some honor here. Um, you you are us on some on so many levels and you give all of us on the screen some something important here. Um, you have a group of people here, of course, primarily rooted in education, but they are professionals and activists. We talk about taking strong stands and improving lives, uh, being uh, having an understanding of who we are really for each other and what our responsibilities might be as professionals and as personal and personally for the society. And of course, we are dying to always think about how we create communities. So uh, we see you as one of those incredible examples of that in our lives. And, um, you know, I know for me, part of why this is such an honor is I, I've always said, Alicia Garza knows how to take next steps. Alicia Garza also knows about healing, in particular Black healing. And I see so much of your work as being about healing and of course, community and everything else. So I'd love to just give a quick introduction and see if I can incorporate some of these conversations and questions we've been having along the way, if that's all right. That sounds great. And thanks so much for having me. Oh, absolutely. So we all have been looking at uh, your, your book, The Purpose of Power and uh, how we come together when we fall apart. And for me, that's about solidarity. I think that is just a, a statement about solidarity. We all know, or maybe people don't know that uh, Alicia is the founder of Black Futures Lab. And uh, people describe you as an innovator, a strategist and an organizer. We know that you are one of the co-creators of Black Lives Matter and the Black Lives Matter Global Network. Uh, but also, I think folks are not aware that you've also been a strategy and partnership director of the National Domestic Workers Alliance as well, and co-founder of Supermajority. And you're from Oakland. And I love that you call yourself a cheeseburger enthusiast as well. I am. I am. <laughs> All right. So uh, welcome. And thank you for being with us overall. You know, I, I guess what I'd love to do is just to start with, I'm, I'm going to go sort of in reverse. I, I, I do a few things for you to take a look at, but I heard someone say today, how do you keep a sense of hope? Because you, you seem to elude that, exude that. So that was my how point. do you do that? Mm. Well, first, let me say thank you for the opportunity to come and dialogue with you all today. Um, I am talking to you now from um, the Pacific Northwest, uh, which is um, full of trees and snow in April. <laughs> and um, bear with me for a second because this is getting to the answer to your question. Of course. Um, I am not always hopeful. Um, and I think it's just important to say that. I, I do think I have a disposition of um, future forward thinking and um, never being satisfied with um, how much progress we've made or how far we've come. And I hope that that does come across as hope. Um, for me, sometimes it is um, really a feeling of like, are we ever going to get there? <laughs> so maybe it's impatience. Um, but in general, I, I think that the cultivation and the maintenance of hope requires a few things. Um, one, it requires the ability to acknowledge when you're just not there. Um, I think there is sometimes a pressure, particularly for people um, who spend so much of their time on social change to be hopeful and always be feeling like things are um, moving forward. And the fact of the matter is you don't always feel that way. And I think we just need to have more conversations about that. Mm -hmm. The other piece though, is really about the maintenance of our own wellness. And I don't talk about this so much as self-care because I think 
the conversation there has been very distorted to, you know, try and combat fear or desperation or anxiety or grief and sadness with like bubble baths or, you know, yoga or massages and things like that. And we should do those things. They're good for you. They're good for your body. They're good for your nervous system. Um, But I think we don't pay enough attention to the maintenance of a regular practice of coming back to what you're here to do and why, what's your why. And for me, whenever I don't feel hopeful, um, I come back to, well, what is it that I'm doing this for? Why am I doing this? I could be doing anything. I don't have, I'm not stuck here, right? I could be, right. Uh, right. I think my happy place, if I'll just share is um, uh, naming nail polishes and lipsticks for a living. I think I'm always like, uh, uh, I could be doing that. <laughs> right? Like I don't have to be doing what I'm doing, but um, naming lipsticks and nail polishes for a living doesn't feed me the way that I'm trying to figure out how to make Black communities powerful in every aspect of our lives feeds me. And so there are things that I have to do every day to bring me back to that. Um, and for everybody, it's going to be different. For me, um, you know, I, I have to get in good belly laughs every day because I, I have to remind myself um, that the work is serious and it's important, but I don't have to be serious all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, for me, it involves paying attention to my like wellness and my sleeping and my eating, my drinking water and my moving my body. Um, and then the other piece of it for me, honestly, is about maintaining a community of people around me um, who care about the things that I do. Um, and not in terms of like, they care about what I'm doing, but they care about the same things that I do. And um, that is important because, you know, it's almost like a game of whack a mole right? <laughs> when one of us is not feeling so hopeful, <laughs> somebody else is actually feeling hopeful. And maybe we just need to tap into their energy for a bit. So that's, that's some of my um, well-kept secrets in terms of how I maintain hope. Wow. Well, you know, and your conversation about maintaining that hope sort of gets to, I think, the secrets of, or at least some, some things that are really prescriptive in terms of thinking about how I engage in change, how mm-hmm. I think about the real work. I, I love that you said that you've, you've got to do some work too about putting a community around you or being in a community, that takes work. Mm-hmm. Uh, being around people who you can engage with a little bit, um, these, these are sort of these rules that are pretty important for being effective. So, you know, there are these questions and you've got a lot of folks who deal with young people, teachers who are in this space as well. And there was this really interesting conversation that came up about how we raise or teach or work with young folks so that they can have an efficacy in engaging in change. Mm-hmm. And here's where the real rub came in or the real question came in. Yeah. You know, do we, is divisiveness an important part of this conversation, dealing with divisiveness, uh, or is it about always seeking to uh, be, in a, be in a space where you've got to compromise, where you work together, where you have to be on the common ground? So, I mean, what are your thoughts about that? Hmm. You know, honestly, I, I think um, maybe we're not asking the right questions. Mm. Um, when it comes to young people, in particular, it's not so much what do we talk about and what do we not, because then, frankly, we should be talking about everything. Um, young people are sponges and um, are often grappling with the same questions that we are, and they're seeing a lot of things, but because we are so anxious about framing conversations for young people, conversations that we think they can handle or you know, absorb, um, we may be missing um, the opportunity to just like listen to what they're seeing and hearing and feeling and help them make sense of it um, or acknowledge, hey, it does, just doesn't make sense. I don't know either. <laughs> and so like the fascination with curating and cultivating conversations for young people can sometimes get in our way. Um, we absolutely have to be talking about divisiveness. We have to be talking about ways to come together, but we have to be putting it in context. Um, 
you know, the best education that I ever received um, as a young person was the education that was necessary to understand the conditions around me and to put any of those questions inside of a, a framework that helped me understand why a thing was happening. Um, you know, the, the best training that I got as a young person was media literacy, right? Mm. And learning how to discern fact from fiction, um, understanding, right? That there was a lot of fiction out there, that not everything I read um, right. is fact. Um, right. Some of the best education that I've gotten uh, has been rooted in helping me understand um, the lineage of debates. Um, because these are ongoing, right? We're having the same fights that we've been having for a long time. It's just a different day. Um, you know, whether it be about abolition or whether it be about, um, you know, uh, do we, uh, some people call it censorship, right? And some people call it values. It just depends, right? right? right. Um, you know, conversations about reproductive justice and freedom, conversations about, you know, democracy, right? And we need to be engaging young people in those discussions, but for them to actually engage and for us to um, follow through on our mission of like, not trying to tell people what to think, but also kind of trying to tell people what to think. I think we need to make sure that we're giving people tools. So rather than issues, we need tools. Um, we need tools to understand history and how it plays out today. We need tools to understand how to critically think. Um, and unfortunately, academia doesn't always do that. Um, my what? Training, what? Really? I know. I know. <laughs> my training in the academy has been varied. Um, you know, I do know how to do academic writing. And I also feel like I got taught a lot about how to regurgitate other people's thoughts and not create my own. Um, I do know how to engage in debates, but I didn't learn how to not take those debates personally. Um, I was taught things that um, were fairy tales in a lot of ways, like um, journalism is neutral. No, it's not neutral. It's mm. absolutely not neutral. We should stop saying that. Mm. Um, what is this fascination with neutral journalism? There's no such thing and there never has been, right? And that's a historical debate. But we need people to be equipped with the tools to be able to participate in today's society. And too many of our young people are not equipped with those tools. And so we lose them and then we lament about having lost them. But we didn't actually do the work to give them the tools in their toolbox to be able to forge new paths and help us actually learn more, right? So that's, that's where I would weigh in on that. Got you. So I love how you talk about the history of the debate. I think that's really important. And I, I, I must admit, I was struck in your book how you showed lineage. You know, I, I know about your mama. I know about mm -hmm. how you grew up. And also to put that in context about who you are and how you develop about who you are and how you hold that, but you're still moving along and changing some things. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of times people will say that it is really hard to get people to think about history and to do, again, more a part of the work. And that is to understand the history of the debate. <laughs> you know, wh what about the tools for that? I think that a lot of folks who are in this educational space, um, as you say, forget about that or don't pay attention to it, but probably want to, but need to find a way to think about that. Some thoughts? Yeah. Um... Well, I mean, you I mean, quite, quite a bit to history. No, it's I, a lot, but I, I appreciate the, the first thing that just came to mind is that we are having an intense uh, struggle over history and who gets to tell it and what history we get to tell and, you know, from whose perspective. And that is the culmination of generations of work to tell fuller, more complex stories. And we shouldn't abandon that. And I see us doing that a little bit. Um, we're so enmeshed in the conversation about what is critical race theory, <laughs> right? And where is it being taught, right? That we forget to talk about um, the lineage. Why is critical race theory even a thing? 
And um, when you do that, right, all of the nonsense around it today makes plenty of sense. But there are so many people who don't have the tools to understand the lineage that they're only having half the conversation. Um, And this isn't at all to say that people are stupid or unintelligent. That's not true. Um, What's true is that people can only work with what they know. Um, And in as much as we can broaden the conversation to um, go further than academics and theorists, right? The better for all of us. Um, How do we popularize lineage? Um, You know, I talk in my book about the fairy tales that we tell about history. Um, you know, the fairy tale that Rosa Parks woke up one day and decided she wasn't going to move to the back of the bus. Right. Um, you know, there's so many stories like that um, that have been popularized in our society, and they are the stories that people know. And so, therefore, um, people think that we've already solved problems that we have not. Uh, people think that they cannot be a part of solving the problems that we have in our society um, because they don't see themselves in those stories. Um, And we also have a challenge by which um, we continue to understand systems of violence and oppression as um, interpersonal conflict where people are being mean to each other. Um, Racism has nothing to do with people being mean to each other. There are very nice people who are racist. Um, Same thing with sexism, same thing with homophobia, right? Like any of these um, systems of segregation Um, can involve very nice people who are well-meaning and well-intentioned, but they have been um, shaped, right, Um, to see the world in a particular way. So with that being said, um, our work is to get literate in how we make things make sense for people. And um, I'm not trying to slam the academy here, but like I had to unlearn a lot of things. Um, The academy is focused on steel sharpening steel. That's not a bad thing, but it's like you get into the, like the hair that is like 0.005 of an inch, right? Right. And we're building whole cannons on top of the the splitting of hairs. When actually the whole point, right, is to make this information as accessible as possible so that it itself can be revolutionized over and over and over again. It's not just the job of the academy to produce knowledge. Um, knowledge is produced everywhere and it's produced through experience. It's produced through um, exposure, right? Observation, participation, all of these things. And right. we need to be paying more attention to um, how do we widen and broaden the circles of people who are having these conversations, again, with the tools that they need to participate in a way um, that um, is based on some kind of truth. Right. Not the truth, but some kind of truth. Yeah. <laughs> so that's so, what I'm looking forward to. All right. So walk me through a little bit. Let's 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 reimagine this a bit. You know, I happen to agree a lot of what you said about higher education. What what would it look like, you think? What should it look like? What should high, you know, here I'm in a private education space in a city. Uh, that's got its own history and everything else. Yeah, what do you think it should look like? Higher ed should look like for people to do, I think what you just said is to make this, these places a little bit more of democratic speech speech environments, uh, of activists, democratic activist spaces, uh, and still produce knowledge and everything else. But what would that look like? Well, first and foremost, it looks like admitting different and new people. Um, this is another debate we've had for such a long time, admissions, right? And still eligibility it, still mm-hmm. criteria, right? And the recruitment of underrepresented students. You know, we have to do a better job of making sure that we are bringing in people from increasingly diverse backgrounds. And I don't just mean race, I mean experience, I mean class, I mean um, mm-hmm. geography, right? Like. That needs to be our main task and main focus. Too few people have access to these halls. Too few, too few. And so therefore, if we want to encourage the replication and dissemination of new ideas, you got to bring in new people. 
<laughs> so, and teachers. So it's not just in terms of students, it's also um, in terms of who is holding space around these and bringing these containers of learning together. And this has been a long debate inside of um, the academy as well. And I think it often gets framed as, um, oh God, how do we talk about it? People often talk about it as like, some kind of like diversity of thought, which usually means, right, that you bring on people who are inflammatory um, and you say, okay, well, <laughs> we, we've brought in diversity of thought, right? <laughs> um, but that's not actually what we're working with here. And I, I feel like um, we would be wise to kind of push back against that. What we, it's not about bringing out, bringing in people who are so far out there right? That we just assume that because they have a, a radically different opinion about how the world functions, um, that that somehow is creating a more um, um, inclusive or uh, rigorous environment. Um, right. That's a very dangerous uh, assumption and assertion to make. And in fact, I feel sometimes like it's kind of hiding behind um, the, the, the truth, which is that institutions also have a point of view. Our universities have a point of view. You cannot be sending brochures out to students about your diversity when you're bringing people in who are against diversity. Like that is not, um, it's a red herring conversation and we need to call it out as it is. We need to make education accessible to more people. Um, but accessibility doesn't mean find somebody really extreme and call it a day. Right, right. So, you know, the thing that we uh, do appreciate about you is the way that you have been wonderful at connecting uh, these thoughts, these movements, um, people, identities, uh, to, to help a lot of people see that our struggles can have some connections with each other. Um, that has got to be hard uh, when you are in certain communities and where you may be associated. Now, you know, certainly if people do their reading, they know that you've been doing lots of work in a variety of different spaces, whether it be about poor folk, whether it be about working class folk, whether it be about black folk, women, uh, queer folk, et cetera. Uh, but many people latch on to, of course, black folk with you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know, how, how is that working to really open up what your active voice is about, what you're trying to do, and getting people to see that while there may be these focal points, you've got, I think, more of a universal look at struggles that are out there. Mm. Yeah, um, I think um, what is true is for the last, I don't know, 15 years or so, um, I have really been focused on Black folks. Mm -hmm. And I do that intentionally. Um, and Black people are not a monolith. And so, yes, in that space, I can be doing work around workers' rights um, and labor. I can be doing work around poverty and economic exclusion. I can be doing work around gender. I can be doing work around sexuality because everything that's happening in the world impacts black people um, and, we, and it impacts us uniquely and differently. And um, black people are impacted by every system of segregation that you can possibly imagine. And so that's why that work and moving between those arenas is necessary. I can't, um, you know, organize in a community around environmental racism and destruction without also organizing around poverty, without also organizing around workplace justice, without also organizing around gender. Um, it's literally impossible, literally impossible. I mean, who lives next to toxic sites? Usually poor and working class people. Yep. Um, what are poor and working class people doing, right? What is the work that poor and working class people are doing? It's often in workplaces, um, that are not unionized and that are not regulated. Um, you know, why are these workplaces not regulated or uh, unionized? Well, because there's a massive attack on unions um, and the labor movement by corporations and um, uh, the financial industry, right? Because it doesn't serve uh, the interests of profit. Um, and so 
you know, and then why aren't people doing anything about it? Well, because people are being barred from participating in creating and changing the rules that govern their lives every single day. I mean, again, we have to tell more complex stories and I am not apologetic in any way about um, working with black communities. It is um, my community and um, certainly it is where I feel like I can have the most impact and um, be the most effective. However, my hope is that in um, not being issue focused, but being community focused, that it is also um, a model for other communities, right? To um, not feel like they have to be siloed into issues that um, we isolate, but our communities don't isolate them in that way. Um, our communities do not uh, see the, the, the difference between labor rights, right, and racial justice. Like folks see them right, uh, right. very much as the same thing. I like that issue, community focus as opposed to just solely issue focus. I love it. So talk to us a little bit about Black Futures Lab. Oh, yeah. Your work right now. Talk to us a bit. I took a survey and all that. Hey, sort of stuff. thank you for I taking the Black Futures. I gave you a couple dollars, center. everything yeah, else. But, uh, but talk to us a little bit about that. Oh, this is my baby. Um, I'm really proud of this work. I started this organization. It was an idea that I kind of held on to, kind of like my naming nail polishes and lipsticks idea. Um, <laughs> it was my happy place during the 2016 election um, uh -huh. where it was just so chaotic and there was so much at stake. And I kept saying, okay, if I can get through this, um, what I'm going to do on the other side is I'm going to build a vehicle that is focused on translating symbol into substance for black communities as it comes to politics. Mm -hmm. And too often black folks are spoken about, but we're not spoken to about the issues that matter most to us. Um, and we get presented with a lot of symbolic overtures that rarely result in any material changes. And that is not a reason to disengage. It's a reason to lean in harder and to fight harder. And so that's what we do at the Black Futures Lab. We work to make Black communities powerful in politics so we can be powerful in the rest of our lives. And the way that we do that is by building the capacity of our communities to fight and win. Um, some of the work I'm most proud of um, over the last four years uh, now four years in February, is um, our Black Public Policy Institute, where we train Black grassroots leaders how to write, win, and implement new rules in cities and states. We literally are training people how to write and win policy. Um, we had our first policy victory last year, where we got the governor of California to sign a bill that was designed in our policy institute by the Young Women's Freedom Center, which essentially um, revises sentencing guidelines for people who have been convicted of crimes that they were coerced into as a result of um, domestic violence, um, intimate partner violence, et cetera. Um, we, and I'm, so, I'm super excited about that. And we're on our second cohort right now that is about to graduate in a week. Um, and they have spent September, October, November, December, January, February, March, April, eight months with us. Um, learning all the ins and outs of policy, being mentored by uh, folks who move policy across the country, um, and really reimagining not just what rules govern our lives, but how we can reimagine the democracy that governs our lives as well. Um, and we'll be kicking off a new cohort uh, in September. Wow. Uh, so I'm very excited about that. I'm excited about our Black Census Project, which aims to collect recent and relevant data about Black communities and who we are and what we care about and what we want to see done about the challenges we face in our communities. Um, our first census was done in 2018. We launched our organization with this project and um, we were able to accomplish being the largest survey of Black people in America since Reconstruction. We relaunched that program um, this year and we're reaching to be the largest survey of Black people in history, uh, gathering 200,000 responses from Black folks in all 50 states. Um, so we're super stoked about that. And um, if you haven't taken the Black Census, please do so at blackcensus.org. 
I'm also really proud of our work to motivate, educate, and activate Black voters across the country. In 2020, we talked to a million Black voters in our very first field program during COVID. Wow. <laughs> and wow. we are continue, we've been continuing to do that work in between and, and at the same time as election cycles. This year, we're focused um, through our C4 organization on secretary of state races and governor's races um, and making sure that our communities have the tools we need um, to put people in place who um, match the agenda that we have for our communities. So we're stoked about that. Um, and I will also just say one of the things I'm also really proud of um, is that we've grown our team from two people with a dream uh, to 15 folks who come from every background you could possibly imagine. It is a joy to work in an organization of Black people, about Black people, by Black people, where every single one of us is passionate about changing the rules that impact our lives every day. And every single one of us is not willing to give up, um, no matter how dire our circumstances may be. Um, we are all very committed um, to making sure that nobody gets left behind. Um, so that's what we're working on. Got you. So I love that, you know, again, I hope people see this is that example. People will often ask, um, other than voting, what's activism look like? And I think that you, you just laid that out in so many ways uh, about that. And, you know, I'm going to do a pitch. We're doing a lot of work here about data science. Mm -hmm. And we are also, of course, you know, Ibram Kendi is here. Yes. And also that data and data science and particularly about black folk comes together. So I hope that you have this. Um, I hope you have this, I hope we have this opportunity to get you here and to work with you. Uh, and, and the training program just sounds like something a lot of students here would vibe with. Yes, please. So, so I want to do this. I want to ask you, I want to ask Harden Coleman to get on because I want you to ask this question, Harden. Hop on. Great, Ms. Garza. So, um, um, thank you so much for being here. This is very exciting. We've been looking forward to this uh, a great deal. And the question that um, so I'm I'm a I, I'm a I train school counselors and I'm a psychologist. And so I, as much as I think about the ecological large picture, a lot of my work is around the individual development. Yep. And so one of the questions I like to ask people who are engaged in in, in your type of work is. What's the, how do you think about the role of character, both your own character development mm. and the character development of others as part of your work, foundational, mm. tangential. So as you come in, as you're bringing people in, interns in, creating an organization, how do you think, what, what does character and its role mean to you as you, because it's more explicit about the ethic of caring that you've demonstrated, the focus of community you've demonstrated, but what's the role of character in your work? Or not at all. I mean, I'm, I'm not saying it has to be. No, it's central. Um, you know, it's interesting. I was looking forward to this conversation this last week. I've spent um, having my character attacked um, pretty wide in a pretty widespread way. And so I've been thinking a lot about um, the importance of character and integrity and what it means to us. Um, and forgive the pop culture reference, but all week I've been having in my head, uh, you know, Tina Turner's famous line when she divorced from Ike Turner, who was like beating the crap out of her and doing all the worst things to her. And she's in front of the judge, right? And the judge is like, I mean, don't you want any of these assets? And she's like, no, I just want my name. Um, and, you know, that, that, um, that assertion is so deeply important to me. But beyond like the ongoing character attacks that happen to activists all the time um, and to you know, us from you know, previous and current iterations of Black Lives Matter, um, character is actually really important in organizing um, and in social change work. And um, you know, I always say to people that there is very much a difference between activism and organizing and maybe character can be um, included in a litany of qualities um, and activities that distinguish the two. You know, I was talking to a, a friend today about, you know, the difference between service and organizing and service 
being important work, um, but also being relatively a transactional work, right? You give something that somebody needs, right? <laughs> and they get it, right? And that's kind of the end of the interaction. But in organizing, everything is built on relationships and it's built on whether or not people trust you. It's built on whether or not people trust that you have a vision and trust that um, you can do what you say you're gonna do. Um, I was trained um, in organizing and one of the major things that we always would say is like, number one, never ask somebody to do something you wouldn't do yourself um, and always follow up and follow through. Yeah, don't tell people you're gonna do something that you don't do. Um, and the reason for that is because organizing is about leveraging relationships for change. Um, it's about building people's capacity to lead, but also their trust in themselves to, to be able to do so. Um, and the relationship between an organizer and others that they are organizing, whether it be in a campaign or any other kind of initiative, is really sacred. Um, it, it's anytime you're learning something new, right, from someone else, you are inherently becoming vulnerable with them. Um, and you're, and you're um, extending trust, right? And somebody has to believe in your good character, right? In order to accept whatever it is that you're offering them. And also to be able to show up and participate and um, um, talk about what they know and what they don't know and what they wanna learn and what they're scared of, right? Like organizing is like a sacred art in my opinion. Um, and so the role of character is deeply important. The role of integrity is deeply important. Um, and that is why I also believe that um, these attacks are so um, insidious, right? Because what they go for um, is people's trust in your character, trust in your ability to produce the change that you wanna see. Um, and it's, it's based in, um, you know, a, a lot of um, tropes that we have about social change and organizing because we tell so many fairy tales about how change happens. People want things to fall from trees. We look at politics and protest as like, I call it snack machine politics, right? So you put your quarter in, you press B2, you get your Snickers bar and you're on your way. <laughs> And I wish that's what was going on because honestly, um, I'd have more time to name lipsticks and nail polishes for a living, but um, because that's not how it goes, um, you know, we lose a little bit of something in relationship to um, being okay with change being quick and slow. Um, I heard a lot of questions while I was curling my hair, getting ready for y'all. Um, about the, well, how do we do this, right? We now have this moment where people are talking about things we've never talked before and how do we do it? And um, it's just not lost on me that these are the right questions to be asking, but don't be so caught up in those questions that you forget how long it took for us to get here and how threatening it is that we're here. Um, people do not want to have these conversations um, and that is why they are attacking our character. Right, it is why they are saying this is not a person for you to believe. It's almost like the Wizard of Oz, right? Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. It's my favorite. That's my favorite scene in the movie. And then you pull the curtain back, and it's just like this little guy with a microphone on a milk crate. Um, so, anyways, not to get off on a tangent here, but um, character, however, is different than personality or brand. Um, and I talk about this a lot in the book. I think. Um, we can assign character to people who haven't earned it. Um, and we can um, take for at face value things that um, we actually should question more of, right? Um, not everybody who says they're an activist is an activist. That's not to say they don't do important things in the world, but words mean things, right? Um, so uh, I, I don't know if there's a, a step to take except to say um, we need more tools to help us make better decisions about people's characters. And 
in this age where for the only time in my lifetime, and I, I, I can't remember historically um, when this has ever happened, but I could be wrong. I'm not a historian, although I like to think I am. Um, this is the first time that I know of where people who are involved in social change have been elevated to the level of like celebrities, right? Um, and as such, we treat activism and organizing with a celebrity culture lens, um, which is really dangerous. Uh, the work I do doesn't belong on TMZ, right? It is like the messiness of what happens when people come together and try to accomplish something together and they've never worked together before and everybody brings their own stuff, right? And for a long time, we've been able to do that in private as you should, um, but now you can't, right? Now you can't do that. You don't get a chance to spend the time to work out disagreements that can last for five years, 10 years, 15 years, because it's being plastered all over tabloids, right? Um, and of course, again, there is um, an agenda there, um, which is to get people to question the character of our movements, the legitimacy of them, the honesty and integrity of them. Um, and it's not lost on me, right? The timing of how those things happen. Um, this easily could have happened last year in the midst of a new administration, but it did not. Um, it's happening uh, on the brink of the next midterm election, right? Where um, the conversations that this movement has advanced around policing and safety, um, around democracy and governance um, are a point of deep consternation for people who like the way that things are right now. Um, so anyways, end rant on that, but um, thank you for the question. It's all right, that's all right. You know, I once heard you talk about power versus empowerment. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, I think it works really well here. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes. I had the, I, so I'm in the Pacific Northwest this week um, to train young organizers here, Black and Latino organizers. And we had a long conversation yesterday about power and empowerment. You know, I define power as the ability to make the rules and change the rules. Um, and there's multiple forms of power that are um, operating at any given time. And there's multiple forms of power that we need to be building at any given time. But ultimately, it's fundamentally about the ability to make the rules and change the rules. And empowerment is something quite different. Empowerment, um, the way I define that is our ability to feel good inside of our current circumstances. Feel good about ourselves, feel good about our world. You know, I do a lot of Superman poses in the mirror before I do things like this, right? I'm like, <laughs> I'm feeling good. You know what I mean? I can do this, right? I get my power stance on. Um, and that's great. That's totally great. But when I walk outside my front door, um, I'm reminded of all the ways in which I don't get to make the rules about the way that my life is organized and determined. Um, and that is what power is really about. Um, and so I make the distinction because I think oftentimes um, when we're talking about social change and I'm saying this from experience, when I decided this is what I was gonna spend my time on, my parents were like, oh my God, this must be a phase. We did not send you to college to do these things. We sent you to college because we wanted you to be a lawyer or a teacher or, you know, I wanted to be an architect at some point. I guess I kind of made it, but not in the traditional way. Right. right. <laughs> right? But their framework around this work was charity. Mm -hmm. um, and so it naturally involved a lot of assumptions about, you know, she's helping the people that are less fortunate and, you know, that kind of thing. And the assumption there, right, is like, what's, where's the career in that? Where's, can you feed a family on that? That's kind of thing. Right. Um, and I don't blame them for that, right? Because that's what most people think. They think Red Cross, UNICEF, that kind of thing. Um, but alongside that framework, right, um, there is an assumption that to change bad things that are happening in the world, people need to feel better about themselves. Mm. So um, I might be poor, but I want to feel good 
about myself being poor, right? right. <laughs> um, I, I might be being held back because of my gender, but I want to feel really good about my gender. And it's like, well, that's actually not changing your circumstances in any way. Um, why, why are you poor? <laughs> what is this category of woman or man? Like what, where does that come from? And what is the purpose of it? Um, and why does being assigned to one get you farther and being assigned to the other keep you back? Um, what do we do about that, right? And that's where the question of power comes in. Empowerment is often used to mask um, the role and impact of systems and who has power inside of them. So if everybody feels empowered, right, then there's nobody who's abusing power. Right, got you. Mm -hmm. So if I can, I'm, I wanna invite uh, people to go ahead and unmute and unmic yourself and you can ask your question yourselves. So go right ahead. We'll, we can go one at a time, but let's go ahead and unmute and unmic and and go ahead and do it. So when we were talking earlier, Ms. Garza, one of the questions that came up that got repeated a couple of times that, that, that uh, you talked a little bit about, like you'd be maybe more explicit, is this, what's your thoughts about how do we raise up young people? So you, you, you're, you're in a college of education, human development. So we're, 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 we're pretty grounded around PK-12 is a lot of what the people on, the, on, on, on this call are thinking about. Mm -hmm. But how do you raise up young people's efficacy to both be productive um, and not divisive? Mm. How do you get people to take on challenges and change in a way that is moving the whole community forward and that the efficacy that their, their efforts will matter? Mm. And, and if I could add to that, you know, there was also this conversation too that maybe divisiveness has its place mm -hmm. as well in the process. Huh. Yeah, I, I, I feel like we are in an era where we need to pick some fights. I, um, I, I don't believe in neutrality for the sake of being neutral. Um, and I don't think it serves people to say, well, I don't have an opinion, but what do you think? No, you have an opinion and you should say what it is because as long as we don't, um, we allow a lot of atrocities to remain atrocious. Um, so I think we're in an era where we need to pick some fights. Um, they should be strategic ones, but they should be fights nonetheless. Um, I think that um, there are tools that folks need um, strategy tools are big ones. I, again, spent a whole day training young people yesterday on the use of strategy and how to design it and develop it. Um, strategy being a plan to win, right? Um, not just the things you do to implement your plan, but like, what is your plan overall? Um, and that plan should really include an analysis of who has power and who doesn't and how you shift the balance of power. Um, I think, um, young people could really benefit from the tools of organizing. Um, a lot of which I write about in my book. Um, and I wrote that book because it was a book I wish I had when I was first starting out as an organizer. And there was nothing for me to use that was contemporary. Like I was able to read stuff from, you know, people doing retrospectives on the forties and the fifties and the sixties, but there wasn't really any accounting of like how the, activities of bringing people together to accomplish a goal had shifted because the landscape had shifted. Um, and I think that that's useful. Um, organizing is useful in every single context that you can imagine. Um, and the last thing I would just offer is, um, I think there was a question earlier that I overheard as I was curling my hair um, about how do we understand how to develop professionals, right? Who have these values in their workplaces um, and can still kind of carry out the functions of their job, but also have a lens towards justice. And um, I think the first part is really just understanding um, how our workplaces come to be, right? Um, I talk a lot about, and maybe you all have heard, you know, some of this debate around the nonprofit industrial complex. I don't talk about that, but I do talk about some of the contradictions that exist from um, trying to use corporate vehicles 
right, for social change. It's wild, actually, that we do this, right? Um, but people who want to do this kind of work inside of finance or inside of other sectors um, often are grappling with a lot of things. Um, they're grappling with the discrepancies between what institutions say and what they do and what their impacts are. Um, they are grappling with the um, inefficiencies of how work is done. Um, you know, why can't we deliver things quicker and more efficiently? Well, sometimes it's that, you know, it just doesn't work that way, but sometimes it's actually intentional. Um, and they're also grappling with the tensions of interpersonal dynamics that reflect larger societal dynamics and not knowing how to function inside of that. Um, and it would be too long of me today to run down all of the tools that people need for that, but I think we need tools for that. Gotcha. So if folks wanna raise their hand, we'll get you in. I see that John McCarthy is up next. So John, if you could unmute yourself, uh, both your picture and your mic and go ahead and ask your question. Oh, thank you so much, Alicia. This is wonderful. Uh, mm -hmm. I just had you know to follow up on the 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 notion of empowerment mm -hmm. um, because I think I'm I'm reaching a place where I have to rethink a lot about you know I've run a program at a high school for local Boston Public High School for the last 17 years uh, we use physical activity to engage kids and it's a values based approach. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a, you know, there's a lot of, it's kind of loaded, right? I'm the white dude walking in from the university telling people, you know, that they respect effort, self-direction and caring are important. Yep. And so now, uh, and I'm finding this too in my teaching of graduate students as well. It's like, I am, I'm advocating for, for certain kind of change, yeah. but uh, when you're using the word tools, I'm wondering if you have some thinking about how a person like myself with my, you know, I am the patriarchy, why, you know, I am all that, you know, kind of it's being pushed against. And so, um, I'm trying to find tools for myself to be in the right place. Mm -hmm. You know, for example, I try to bring in uh, different, you know, like I brought in the MIT basketball coach last two weeks ago, who's a, yeah. a black coach and not, yeah. so it's just all decentering whiteness, but I'm just wondering if you're kind of coming across some tools for those people like myself who may be feeling less, I feel less, less efficacious Mm -hmm. and less certain mm -hmm. of where to stand. Yeah. Does that make any sense? It does. It makes so much sense. Um, first of all, can I just say thank you for the work that you do? <laughs> I don't feel like teachers or people who, you know, spend that time really get any kind of love. Um, so thank you for investing your time. You could be doing a lot of other things. Um, secondly, I hear this question a lot. And so I want to say to you directly, lots of people are longing for the things that you're longing for. And one of the challenges, I think, is that um, unfortunately, our organizations and institutions have also become insular. Um, one of my best girlfriends, who is also one of the best campaigners and strategists I know, always says to me, um, we have to stop being content to be the god of small things. <laughs> And also, is there room amongst the woke for the waking? Um, and there are so many people who are like, I wanna learn, I wanna be better. And there's no answers for how you do that. So let me just offer a couple. Um, number one, keep doing what you're doing. Um, keep seeking it out. Um, lots of people get discouraged because they're nervous about saying the wrong thing, doing the wrong thing. And the fact of the matter is you're totally gonna to say the wrong thing and you're totally gonna to do the wrong thing. And so just embrace it, um, but learn from it and keep moving. Don't let it, um, don't let it freeze you in place. 
um, I have said the wrong thing and done the wrong thing and somebody had grace with me. So my hope for you is that somebody has grace for you too. Um, you mentioned Dr. Ibram Kendi earlier, and I think he is doing some of the most brilliant work around providing tools for people to keep learning about how to undo racism. Um, and what I love about his framework, but also the tools he's developed, whether it be, you know, I saw something recently on Instagram, I think, about playing cards, which were basically like conversation starters, <laughs> um, which I was like, that is so brilliant, right? Or, um, you know, kids books or, um, you know, study guides for different things. Like those are tools that I think can help open up and unlock other possibilities. Um, so I would do that. Um, I would certainly keep building a community around you that is interested in the same things that you are um, so that you can learn from each other about what's working and what's not working, what the struggles and challenges are. And the last piece of advice that I would offer, um, which is a daily homework, um, is to keep pushing yourself around the why. Um, I noticed earlier that you mentioned, you're like, I am the patriarchy, right? Like I am right, the poster of what it is that people are fighting against. And I wanna push back on that. Um, we are all shaped by patriarchy. And yes, there is an image that we have in our heads of patriarchy, which is like white, able-bodied, heterosexual, Judeo-Christian men. Um, but I'm here to tell you that, you know, black women advance patriarchy. <laughs> I'm here to tell you, right, that patriarchy is everywhere. Um, and so um, why I'm making that point is not to absolve you of any responsibility. It's to say, um, that right-sized responsibility looks like this. Um, what is the benefit for myself of continuing to try to dismantle these systems? I think people get themselves in trouble when um, they're trying to do something on behalf of somebody else and they don't see why this is good for them. And that requires some real excavation. Um, a conversation I don't think we have enough is like, why is racism bad for white people? We know a lot about how racism impacts people of color, right? And people who are not white, but we don't have like a whole study on like, how is racism harmful to white people? Um, so I would invite you to keep asking that question every day. Why is this in my best interest? So that um, it can keep unlocking places where you might wanna dig in deeper. Thank you so Thank much. Thanks, John. Thanks, Alicia. So my understanding is I've got to start to wrap this up. I'm going to do moderator's prerogative and ask you just the final question. What's bringing you joy right now? Oh, my gosh. Um, being in snow um, is bringing me joy. That might be counterintuitive. And I know Boston gets its due. But yeah, we, we still really got it. It's, like, it's freezing here today. It's like winter yeah. out there today. Yeah, we don't really get that over here. So I'm, I'm like really excited about it. And um, what's bringing me joy today, I'm just remembering um, all the people that have my back. I really needed that. And I've had a lot of people checking in on me and just um, reaffirming for me why I do this and who wow. my peoples are. And I'm feeling really grateful for that and um, carrying that joy with me today. Oh, wow. Well, look, I got your back as much as I can. And, you know, I'm going to say I appreciate you. And that's not perfunctory. I really do. I really do. Thank so you. thank you for joining us. And I want to remind everybody else who's on here to stay on because we're going to have some conversation right now as well. Alicia, an honor, a privilege. Thank you so, so much. Thanks for having me all. I really appreciate it. Have a great rest of your day and enjoy the next part of the discussion. All right, thank you. Peace out. All right. All right, so I think we're getting set for the next part of our conversation where we're gonna probably, uh, if I'm right about this, I'm gonna, actually, you know what might be better if I could turn this back over to you, Harden, to give us some, a, a bit of instruction for what's next. Great, great. Thank, thank you very much. We can probably go back into the whole, um, uh, all of us together, Lizzie. We don't have to have a, a, a pin, but um, 
So essentially, uh, we, we were we designed for much more uh, bigger numbers so we can be more simple. So really, the question is, um, as you've listened and had this conversation, what are the action steps that you see for yourself? All right. Well, um, what really are the next things that you want to do to follow through on what you heard and um, what action steps do you want to take? And I'm not going to model this time. Um, I'll, I'll jump in. So I'm, you know, my work has always been in the elementary school space. And um, as Alicia was talking, she was saying, you know, she she didn't have time to list all of the tools, you know, that we need to be um, giving people in order to um, find that self-efficacy and knowing what to do. And so my my next move, I think, is is more research in that regard, like looking at, okay, what are what are those tools? Um, and I imagine they're really outlined well for adults and kind of looking at the looking at that toolbox and thinking, what does this look like for children? And and what um, what kinds of lessons do young people need in order to to feel they have access to those tools? Okay, great, thanks. Not fair, John. She gave you your next steps. You know, that, that, to use. <laughs> I've got homework. Yeah, yeah. I I'm kind of um, curious to hear what you all think about the role of a place like Boston University in this. Um, you know, how do we use our power, and and how do we, what pit fights do we pick? And I mean, I, there's so many gems in her comments, but what fights do we pick? And how do we proceed in those fights um, internally as well as in the community? And how do we hold ourselves accountable for um, using what we get from our students and our and grant, grantors and endowment dollars to, fight the fights that will make a difference. And um, yeah, anyway, and I think John's homework is certainly my homework. We, well, we, many of us have that homework, I think, John, so. Well, I was a little moved by her conversation about ask the why question. <clears throat> whatever, as I organize and prioritize my day, my week, my year, you know, why? And I, I've actually been asking that a lot, you know, I'm at a, I don't know, whatever period of my career it is, uh, I don't quite understand it yet. So the, that's an important question to ask. And, 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 and for me, my next steps are being really clear about what is my role now? given the power that I have as a senior faculty member at an R1 institution who has some recognition in the community, what are the roles that I have that aren't about um, uh, actually, she's the word, the service role that I've always thought was my responsibility, that, that, that doing for others is not necessarily where I'm best used, but what, so why should I do anything if I'm not serving somebody? And I've got to answer that question every day and organize more to, with the eye on how's this driving the equity mission for, the, for me, for the university, for my community. More questions than answers right now. Well, and Harden, going a little bit more, more with that why, I see so many things that we do around here without asking the why or um, being in. So I was recently in a conversation and I was talking about, uh, I was in a conversation, a, a bit of a summit around uh, issues of anti-Semitism. And I was handed a set of action items, good action items in and of themselves. But I had to ask this question that kind of I think was a little off-putting to people, but took everyone aback. And I asked, well, I got these action items, but I, in essence, asked the why. I asked, well, what's our goal here? What are we trying to achieve 
as opposed to me just having 10 action items, what am I trying to do? Am I trying to get to zero? Am I trying to uh, get a different mindset? Am I trying to do some of these other things? But, but ultimately, it's a constant ask of, okay, and why, and why? You've given me, you've gone right to the end and given me a how and a prescription, but I'm just not sure why. Uh, and, and why you think this is an important thing? Why do we think this is an important thing? So I wish we, would, we did more around here, around the collective why. Can I just add in um, this, you know, there's also, I think in academia, you know, speaking to Dean Shard's question too, is that like, what is our purpose in, um, but there's the other question is what's worth doing? You know, like we, I think we do a lot of things. I think particularly professors get pulled in a lot of different directions, but I don't think sometimes we prioritize what has the highest and best good. Um, and I, I think that answering that why question would help us clarify that more, you know, my mother used to say the nuns taught her these Latin words, utile, useful, good, which is bonum, and highest good, which is sumum bonum. And like, we, I don't think we do that sometimes. And so we shy away from the, the I think be, sometimes because we shy away from those difficult, you know, harder things to accomplish. And we'd rather, stay in our comfort zone and just keep you know running the, the paper mill here and and don't rock the boat um but i think we are getting to that it seems to me like we're at a precipice here <laughs> in our society and everything it's like there's some things matter more than others Allison or Aaron, I'd love to give you the last word before we uh, move on and then let people figure out what they're gonna do for dinner. Sorry, I have to go teach. Hi, John. Thank you all. Um, I don't wanna speak over Aaron, but I, I gave it a few seconds. Um, I guess it's interesting being a student specifically and hearing like, um, my educators reactions and responses to how they can better educate like students like myself and like Liz Lizzie's in my program. But I think it's, yeah, I, um, it is inspiring, but it also in a way, it encourages me to think of how I'm going to go and fill in your shoes as like a clinician, as like a counselor and a therapist um, where there's an odd shift of like, I kept thinking of like, oh, I'm youth. I'm the youth that we're all talking about, the young people. And I'm like, wait a second. Like, I'm really, <laughs> <laughs> I see Mary's laughing. Uh, I'm, it's an interesting perspective shift of stepping into this weird combination of, yes, I'm still the youth of how we help the young people. Like that's, I still consider myself in that group. But I also have to think this other hat of like, okay, well, when I'm working, like, how do I help my young people? Um, and it's, it's inspiring to see, like, it never really stops, you know, like to see the people above me are still considering the next generation, the next generation. So I guess it's not so much a question, but just an overall comment to wrap us up of like, it feels good to know that like, there is like vulnerable conversations of like, I know I need to change. I know I need to be better. How do I do that? And so, so like to see that in action was really great for this talk. Um, and it did leave me with like, oh, someone, oh yeah. Um, and it did leave me with um, a lot of thoughts going forward in my own future and practice as a student and then later on as a professional. So yeah, thank you. It was great. 
I think Allison said it really well. I don't know that I have much more to add. Um, I really was just taking this as a learning opportunity. And I guess I just want to say thank you so much for it. I found it to be an incredibly rich conversation. And it's just, I'm someone who's been out of work for a while and out of school for a while. And just the opportunity to kind of have these discussions and learn from such incredible people is, it, it means a lot. So um, yeah, I think my takeaway is just to continue to learn. I'm gonna go buy her book. I wanna learn more about activism <laughs> and what else I can do. Uh, I think just in a, a more deep uh, and engaged way. So thank you very much. Well, great. Well, I want to thank you all for spending the time and 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 this, you you guys get the, you're doing the full the, the full route here, and so and really appreciate it. And once again, you know, I I haven't answered a question that Mary had asked a couple weeks ago about what is this center about and what's our mission, what are we doing? And so I get to answer your question now, Mary. So I'm doing my homework. I'm being I'm catching up uh, almost. Um, and that what really Charmaine Charmaine probably reached out to you. <laughs> yeah. But the, but the real issue is how do we the the goal of the center is to had this conversation, get people to come together in places, as you say, Alice, vulnerability and across sectors to really have these conversations, learn more, hear their perspective and think about how we, how then we walk out of here and saying, how do I use my character to implement caring within our community? And then that's really what this center is about. And I want, I really appreciate that Alicia really got at that. I thought oh, wonderfully and that's her work. And, and as John suggested and David uh, affirmed, this is a daily labor that, uh, and then hopefully you know, my, my theory of this college, it is a supportive environment to labor and fail, get feedback and move forward. I wanna thank um, David for the support you give us in doing that and everybody for being here. And Ken, thank you so much for moderating. Um, you, know, uh, you, 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 know, you know, I think you're a rock star. So thank you for your time. <laughs> it was an honor, thank you. I take care. And Lizzie, again, thank for all your support. Mary Ellen, if you're still around, thank you. Thank Lizzie. Bye -bye. Have a great day, everyone. Yeah. Thank you all so much. Bye-bye. Thank you.